Western music has evolved over the millennia, like a river carving wrinkles into the Earth's skin, with the collective, unimaginable effort of all of the great geniuses of the human story. A feeble, slow drip becomes an artisan's knife, skillfully carving up a pathway for new water to flow. Every droplet yearns to push through the known into the unknown, and yet only one in a million get through. But what happens when suddenly, in a single moment, the river breaks from the confines of its earthly prison? and against all laws of physics, forms a brand new branch in the blink of an eye. What happens when a single artist finds a way to break from conventional structure, from the hundreds of thousands of songs that permeate their culture, and pull off something unabashedly risky, grippingly innovative, and perhaps completely game-changing? Well, let's ask Taylor Swift. What's up, guys? My name is Connor, and today we're going to be talking about the song Tolerate It by Taylor Swift. Now, if you've seen my videos before, you probably realized that I am not at my normal setup. I'm currently on the road visiting my grandmother in Colorado, so this lovely brick fireplace behind me will be the backdrop for the day. So, Tolerate It. Tolerate It is the fifth song off of Taylor Swift's Evermore album, which was released as a surprise in December of 2020. As with many, if not most, of the songs on that album, she wrote the song to a track produced by Aaron Dessner, one of her producer mainstays, and also famously fronting the band The National. Tolerate It is a haunting, unorthodox piano ballad. Seemingly mellow and laid back at first glance, but when you really dive in and listen deeply, it's extremely emotional and extremely sad, but also at the same time very empowering. It's also chock full of musical oddities, which we'll talk about later. So much so, in fact, that Desner said he almost didn't send the track to Taylor because he was worried it was so off the wall that she wouldn't even want to write to it. His fears were quickly quelled when she sent back the finished track, and according to an interview with Rolling Stone, he said it was so beautiful that it made him cry on the first listen. Lyrically, Taylor Swift has said the song was inspired by the book Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. Rebecca is a book about many things, but one of the storylines is about the protagonist, a young woman in her early 20s, marrying a rich older widower after only two weeks of dating. I won't get into a full summary, but the core part that inspired Tolerate It was that after the marriage, the protagonist found that her husband seemed preoccupied and distant and clearly still infatuated with his former wife who had passed away, named Rebecca. Tolerate It, similarly, is about a young woman who falls head over heels for an older man who, sadly, barely gives her the time of day. The lyrics describe how she's completely completely and utterly devoted to him, but it seems like he just keeps her around to keep her around. This is exemplified well in the chorus, with lines such as, I wait by the door like I'm just a kid. Use my best colors for your portrait. Lay the table with the fancy sh and watch you tolerate it. Throughout the song, the narrator grows increasingly less naive and less blindly in love, and more and more frustrated with the lack of attention she's receiving from her partner. During the bridge, the narrator finally snaps, and for the first time acknowledges the possibility that she could just walk away. And in the lyrics, she kind of presents that possibility as a threat to the partner that's been ignoring her. The story arc is developed in a really interesting way. The first two choruses are exactly the same lyrically, which is not at all uncommon. The lyrics just kind of lament the fact that she puts so much into the relationship and receives nothing in return. However, as she's growing increasingly disgruntled throughout the course of the song, by the time she gets to the third chorus, the only thing that makes sense is a lyrical change. And so you have this huge shift in perspective, where she goes from blindly being focused on her partner to finally understanding her own emotions and how deeply negatively impacted she's been by the relationship. You have lines from the first two choruses, like, I wait by the door like I'm just a kid, use my best colors for your portrait, that change in the third chorus to lines like, what if I break free and leave us in ruins, took this dagger in me and removed it. The second half of the chorus remains the same all the way through. If it's all in my head, tell me now. Tell me I've got it wrong somehow. I know my love should be celebrated but you tolerate it. And in the first two choruses, while she's still blindly seeking out this guy's attention, that stanza just feels like a naive plea. However, the tone shift that occurs during the bridge in the first half of the third chorus makes the exact same lyrics feel ironic, and almost like she's empowered as she's sarcastically conveying the same message. It's really, really cool, and it's something that Taylor Swift often does very well, where she'll call back to lyrics that she's used previously in the song, but the context has changed such that those same lyrics mean something completely different. Just a stroke of genius. There's also something unspoken in the lyrical content of this song that I found really interesting. It's almost like there's a weaponized hypocrisy to what she's saying, where she's accusing this other person of just tolerating her love. But at the same time, she's just tolerating it too. She's tolerating the lack of attention from this man. And they're both just putting up with each other because they have to for different reasons. Another thing she does in this song, as she often does, is bake in these brilliant metaphors. I've said it before and I'll say it again, her use of metaphor is just, oh, it's so, so good. There's a line I've already referenced a couple times. Use my best colors for your portrait. I love that because it 
it seems so simple at face value. But really what it's saying is that she's bringing the absolute best and brightest of what she has to offer to the relationship, solely for the purpose of glorifying her partner. Another metaphor in the song I really love is in the bridge. Where's that man who'd throw blankets over my barbed wire? Basically saying her partner used to dull her jagged edges and help quell her worst instincts. In a single line, she conveys how, at an earlier point in their relationship, this man used to do things for her that he doesn't do anymore. And it very elegantly hints at the fact that who he is, or at least who he's presented himself to be, has changed over the time they've been together. And I love this line for another reason too. It's a perfect example of something else that she does brilliantly all the time, which is make callbacks to other songs she's written. She's borrowed that barbed wire metaphor from a line in her song Invisible Strength, which says, something wrapped all of my past mistakes in barbed wire. Same barbed wire, different song. This is a brilliant positioning tool by her as an artist, because what it does is it signifies that her lyrics are incredibly important and that each line has a very deep level of significance. The tropes that she uses exist through her catalog of song, and not just within individual songs. Another example is the line, I sit and watch you breathing with your eyes closed. Taylor consistently references watching her lover as they sleep. Songs like Paper Rings, Delicate, and Epiphany all have allusions to this. I also love what she does at the very end of the song. You get to the outro, it's pretty much just all instrumental, and you think that things are over. And then she chimes in one last time with I sit and watch you. It closes the loop on the lyrics, since that's the lyric that opened the song. But again, just like with the second half of the chorus, the tone shift has made it mean something very different. At the the end, I sit and watch you almost feels like she's watching him with an element of disdain, watching and waiting to see if he acknowledges his poor behavior. At the beginning, it's more of just an obsessive fangirl type of thing. Past the lyrics, the production of the song is also just brilliant. And to be fair, most of the credit here is given to Aaron Dessner, absolute mastermind. Like many other songs on this album, it's primarily a singer-songwriter type song, but it's peppered with electronic elements that make it feel more poppy. It's a production style that's very common for Aaron Dessner and something he does very well. The song is also infused with his characteristic subtlety. There's no nothing jarring or startling about it. Every section flows into the next very smoothly. The track starts with these really fun reversed piano sounds that kind of catch your ear right away. It's like, that's kind of weird, what is that? And that question is answered about four seconds in when you hear actual piano. Through to the first chorus, mostly what you have is just piano and vocals. Pivoting from the verse to the chorus, you get Taylor singing, ah with these huge, lush harmonies that sort of signify that things are changing and we're going to a different place. The chord progression changes, a little bit more percussion comes in, a bass line comes in with some kick drum elements added, and nothing is overdone. You're not being hit over the head with the fact that you're at the chorus now, but you still know that you're there. Things grow very slowly and subtly all the way through to the end of the second chorus. Then you get to the bridge, and even as the tone is starting to shift, the music doesn't do anything obviously different. However, because of how the song has developed from the start to this point, you are actually in a very different emotional place than when it started. There's this intensity and desperation that wasn't in the track at the beginning. In fact, here's a fun experiment. Listen to the first three minutes of the song, then pause and go back to the beginning and listen to the beginning. You'll hear what a drastic shift there's been from the beginning to that three minute mark. But the cool thing about Aaron Dessner's production style is everything moves in such a subtle way and so under the radar that you don't even fully consciously comprehend how different the place you're now in is. One of the coolest things about this song though, and the reason that I think it's a complete game changer, is the time signature. Now here I'm gonna assign the credit to both Aaron Dessner and Taylor Swift. And here's why. The time signature is the reason that Aaron Dessner was originally hesitant to send this track to Taylor. The song is in a 10-8 time signature, which you can really think of more as a slow 5-4. 10-8 means that you have 10 eighth notes in the span of a measure, which feels kind of like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And in the context of the song, it sounds like this. Here's the verse. I sit and watch you reading with your head low. And here's the chorus. I wait by the door like I'm just a kid. Use my best colors on your portrait. It's such a shockingly uncommon thing to do in pop music. There's only a handful of songs ever within the public eye that use that time signature. You have songs like the Mission Impossible theme song, Take Five by Dave Brubeck, and Four Sticks by Led Zeppelin. All very big and famous songs in their own right, but Tolerate It is the most palatable and popular song in a bass five time signature ever. Now, the idea to use a 5-4 time signature and the execution of that instrumentally, all credit goes to Dessner. However, it is very, very difficult to make a 5-4 time signature feel natural, which is why it's so infrequently done. And where Taylor gets the credit is the fact that she got this track and was able to pull together melody lines, lyrics, themes, all the way through that made sense in that 10-8, or 
five forward time signature. One thing I tell my songwriting students in the rare occasions that I've ever had somebody try to write in five four is that good five four time is like good editing. You want it to be invisible. You don't want anybody to notice that you're doing it. Here's an example of something that's very forcefully in five four time signature that doesn't quite work as a result. <laughs> Because of the time signature, Taylor Swift has more room to kind of meander and free flow with her lyrics, but she does it in a very structured and digestible way. You assume I'm fine, but what would you do if I... She just kind of lets that line wander into the next measure. She doesn't let it completely go. It's still contained and structured, but it allows her to be a little more playful and open-ended with her cadence. The other way she makes this time signature work is by completely ignoring the downbeat. Now, she's still very consistent with the way she structures each line in the stanza, but most of the time she starts from the middle of the measure and has it extend into the next measure. The chorus is a perfect example of this. Pretty much every line in the chorus starts between the third and the fourth beat. If it's all in my head, tell me now. Tell me I've got it wrong somehow. So there you have it. My feeling is this song is a complete game changer in pop music. The time signature alone is enough to make it so unique and so revolutionary that hopefully it opens up doors for other pop artists to try all sorts of weird things with their music. Taylor Swift and Aaron Dessner show in the song that the only limit on creativity is your imagination. And if you're talented enough and you work hard enough at it, you can make things work that nobody thinks would work. So what do you think? Is this song a masterpiece, or am I reading too deep? Let me know in the comments, and please also let me know if there's any other songs you want me to break down like this, Taylor Swift or otherwise. If you've made it this far, thank you for being here, and please like this video and subscribe to this channel. I really appreciate your support, it goes a tremendously long way. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace.